This is American History TV's Lectures in History podcast. This week, a class on World War II leadership, taught by California State University professor Victor Hansen. This episode is from 2010. Okay, um, we're going to continue with this notion of masters and commanders, starting in antiquity with Epaminondas, Caesar, Alexander, Pericles, and going into the Civil War, and then now we're at World War II. And uh, before we start with the Allied commanders, masters, I should say, Churchill and Roosevelt, last week we went over the the four in total, although we didn't talk about Mussolini, just Stalin, Hitler, Churchill, and Roosevelt. I thought we could have a review of what the situation is at the beginning of World War II up to the critical change in 1942, oh, July to December, primarily because of the radical turnaround in the submarine campaign where the Allies get the upper hand, the check of Rommel at El Alamein, and the German disaster at Stalingrad. Okay, let's look at this map for a second. World War II is, it's hard to know when it actually starts. In Europe, it starts on September 3rd when the Allies declare war on Germany after they've invaded Poland along with Russia two weeks later. But the Chinese have been invaded by the Japanese since 1937 and Manchuria since 1931. The Ethiopians have been invaded, Abyssinians, by Italy since 1936. So there's a lot of wars going on. Russia has gone in, it will go into Finland. And all of these wars today are going to coalesce into this concept of World War II. Does everybody understand that? But that's us looking back at that. At the time, nobody said we're in World War II when Germany went into Poland. There was a Finnish war, there was a Polish war, there was a Norwegian war, there was a Abyssinian war, there was a Manchurian war, and they all coalesced by 1941-42 and were seen as a whole. We in the United States say World War II, the British say the Second World War. All of that is, again, in context of the First World War, which wasn't known as the First World War. Whoever thought the great, it was called the Great War, which we don't use anymore because it's no longer the Great War. It's the second greatest war. Great being a macabre term for most casualties. So we're going to look at this. and In this area, and we don't have the Pacific up, but 50 to 70 million people are going to be killed from 1939, the official start in Europe, to the end in 1945. I say 50 to 70. We don't know, really. We still don't know the exact amount. That will be the greatest man-made disaster in the history of civilization, maybe with the exception of what Mao did during the Cultural Revolutions in the 1960s when there may have been 70 million killed for sure. So it's going to be a disaster that no one imagined when the war broke out. It affects everybody in Europe. A hundred million people are going to take part in this war. Nothing's ever been seen like it before. So it's going to affect everybody in the United States, for example, who's not going, and we aren't going to enter until almost halfway through and it's going to affect anybody. I, I'm thinking of my own family that was out in rural California and was minding its own business, going broke farming. And my mother and her three sisters were growing up on a farm. And suddenly the war breaks out. And five years later, she and all of her sisters have gone to Stanford University because the economy has radically changed. Women are in the workforce. Men are off at war. There's openings in universities. My father's flown on a B-29 40 times over Tokyo. The person I'm named after, Victor Hansen, was killed on Okinawa, sort of shattered uh, my uncle's family. My first cousin, Holt Cather, was killed in Normandy. And that whole family is just turned upside down on this event that when they were in the 30s, they thought was so far away. Raisin prices are going to go from $30 a ton to $250. As my grandfather told me before he died, I never made a dime farming except during World War II. So it's going to get the United States out of the Depression. I don't mean the stimulus or just all the borrowing, but the, the irony that the world is going to be destroyed, so to speak. And in 1946, the United States is going to have this enormous industrial base and be the only industrialized, hyper-capitalist power that can supply the world for the next 10 years with everything from washing machines to cars and pay off that debt. 
So where are we? Well, Hitler starts here invading Poland. And just think for a minute how thick and fast events follow. He's going to invade Poland. And then there's going to be a declaration of war, but there's going to be a sitzkrieg, a phony war along the border. France isn't going to do anything. All Britain's going to do is put a, third of a, a quarter to a third of a million troops to help the French. They're going to have a numerical superiority on this flank of Germany of about three to one, and they're going to do nothing. Nobody at this time feels that Poland is going to lead to a war, that there might be some way to adjudicate things especially because Neville Chamberlain represents the Tories, the Conservatives, and they're a member within that clique, and shouldn't use that derogatory term, but they're members within Britain that think that they can still do business with Hitler. Because after all, he's been very, he's much more uh, praiseworthy, uh, praising the British Empire than Franklin Roosevelt, for example, or Joseph Stalin. He admires the British Empire. So he invades here, Nothing happens. He's already carved off large parts of Czechoslovakia here. East Prussia has now been joined to Germany. The Rhineland has been militarized. Austria doesn't really exist. It's part of the Germany. Look how enormous that area is. Germany had the second largest economy to begin with, traditionally in the world after the United States. And now uh, people think he, surely he'll be happy with that. No. In April of 1940, just six months later, he's gone into Denmark. I shouldn't say gone into it. He just burped and swallowed it in three days. He's gone into Norway. He doesn't have to do anything in Sweden. My ancestors are happily selling him iron ore at a discount and providing free transportation in the, in the bargain to make money out of it. Finland has settled. It'll be... Fighting with the Soviet Union, Soviet Union it was kicked out of the League of Nations over it, but it will be neutral now. I should say the Soviet Union is pro-German. I don't mean neutral. Right before Hitler went into Poland, remember he had the non-aggression pact, but that's the, the icing on the cake. As early as 1937, they had trade agreements. So Hit, Hitler is being supplied now uh, in critical areas like bauxite, oil, wheat, coal, iron ore uh, from the Soviet Union. There's a series of fascistic movements in Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Hungary. All of this area of Eastern Europe is supplying as well uh, Germany with iron ore at, at, at not a very advantageous rate. We all know about Mr. Mussolini. Since the late 20s, there's been a, or mid 20s, there's been an Italian expansionary government. They've gone all the way over around, we can't see it, to Somalia. Libya, in March, on March 10th, 1940, he invades France, and he does in 40 days what uh, his, the fathers of the Wehrmacht were not able to do in four years. That is, they take not just the Alsace-Lorraine, but all of France, Belgium, and uh, Holland and Luxembourg. At this point, Algeria, Morocco, the French colonies fall to a sphere of influence controlled under Vichy and allied with Germany. Spain, they fought on the half of the fascist forces under Franco in the Spanish Civil War just five years earlier, four years earlier. Portugal, the same. Turkey, long ally of Germany in World War I, neutral but supplying Germany as it can. So let's look at the map. Where is the bright news for Britain? By 1941, I haven't quite finished. Remember, uh, without warning, Hitler, Italy has invaded Greece, thinks it's going to be easy, but anybody who's been on the northern Balkans knows that it's not, has been repelled. Hitler has sent troops in, not only to save the Italians in Libya, who were fighting not too well against the British, but to occupy Greece, and he does that in a matter of weeks. The first paratroop drop on Crete, very bloody, but ultimately successful. So now let's look at the map. There's a British presence in Cairo and Alexandria, and a, up to the Libyan border. The British have had some success keeping Iraq and Lebanon sort of autonomous. Everything else is under the control of 
Hitler. This is almost like a nightmarish version of the European Union six or seven times over. Everything that Hitler had ever dreamed of, he has, he's attained in just two years. He's starting to ethnically discriminate, or expunge, and ultimately kill the Jews. He's starting to integrate the economy, not very effectively, but still he's starting to integrate it in a, in a manner that will serve Germany. And you've got Ireland that's probably either at best neutral and at worst pro-German, and you've got Great Britain. So in April of 1941, there's nobody else there. The United States is still isolationist. We haven't been attacked by anybody yet. Russia, as I said, nominally a neutral is actually aiding Hitler, and the war is all over with. There's no reason for it to continue because there's nobody really to fight them. They've, the only check on German power has been a failed air campaign in the latter part of 1940 and up until spring of 41 against Britain. But the odds are not good for the British because the airfields are not in Germany now. They're, being, they're in, in Holland and France and Belgium, and they have a direct route to England. And uh, the U-boat campaign is starting to reach a real effective level of cutting off supplies from Britain. What has to be done to end the war? A couple of things. You've got to take Alexandria and cut off the Suez Canal, and they're almost there. After the Italians are re-energized and Rommel is there and they're pushing the fall of Tobruk, they're back up to here, and all they have to do is cut off that, and that essentially ends a third of all the oil imports in the Middle East to Britain. They've got to do a little bit more on the submarine so, uh, campaign so that imports can't come from Canada and the United States. And uh, they've got to get Britain to leave the war, and leave the war not defeated, but leave the war with its empire intact. And that's what Hitler is continually giving these very strange uh, speeches, that he has no problem, no acrimony with the British, that he's willing to cut a deal with them. He's allowed a uh, quarter million British, perhaps another 100,000 French, to escape at D Dunkirk. And all of that sets the stage for the biggest blunder of the entire war, which is probably the biggest blunder in the history of military operations, the June 22nd, three million man invasion of the Soviet Union. At that point, um, everything is off the table. And why does he go into Russia? We'll have some questions in a minute, but as we said last time, most likely for a two-part reason. One, it's it's in accordance with what he said in Mein Kampf, that the Marxist, Leninist, Jewish, Bolshevik presence has to be eradicated. We need living space. German settlers will turn this into a uh, paradise. There will be six-lane roads from Germany all the way uh, down over here to the Crimea, sort of a utopian fantasies on his part. And second, he was not able to get Britain to uh, reconcile themselves to an armistice, and he thinks that once he's conquered Russia and done to Russia what he's done to Eastern Europe, just the sheer weight of the opposition will be so much that there will be people within the British government that will see the light. And, and he has some encouragement of that. There are members of the royal family in as uh, late as 1939 that had had peace feelers out to the Germans. There was a strong conservative, I shouldn't say conservative, reactionary, anti-Semitic presence in Britain and he thinks he can work with these people and have an, an armistice. So that's the general situation that we're at. And before we go on to the two leaders, because this class, after all, is called Masters and Commanders, anybody have a question about the status of World War II as we see it? This is all going to change now because uh, the unforeseen will happen. The United States will get into the war. It will have the most effective aid program to Russia. Russian industry will be relocated, and weather will turn traitor on the, on the, uh, the um, British, Japan will enter the war, etc. But right now, the war, for all practical purposes, is over and won. Any questions? Yes. Um, how independent are the Commonwealth nations of Britain's, like, decision-making? It's a very good war? question, because on our map, we don't have the Commonwealth 
nations such as Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. The thing to remember is a couple of factors are going on. One, they don't have a good taste in their mouth after World War I. Commonwealth forces in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, etc., were put in South Africa, were put on command largely of British officers and were bled white. And there's a lot of resentment against the empire. And that means that, especially after Pearl Harbor, that New Zealand and Australia, who've had two divisions to three divisions fighting the European war, announced to the British, hey, this is another war now, we're going to, and we want all of our troops out of Libya, and we want them back to protect Australia, which, you know, Darwin's going to be bombed. French Canada, I mean, that's a problem, because nominally now Vichy France is on the side of Germany. So what are, what are people in French Canada going to do? Are they going to die for killing uh, people in North Africa that happen to be French speakers? So in this particular war, most of the Commonwealth, is going, and India is the real question, is whether it's going to survive as part of the British Empire. It's going to be uh, a Pacific uh, contribution for the Commonwealth. The great exception to that rule is Canada. Canada's got the third largest navy. Uh, it has about 150 to 200,000 soldiers. And they fight very well. They participate. They don't complain. They don't demand an independent uh, military's command. They're very compliant. They're bitter to this day because they're not given recognition for which they deserve. Canada is essential to the British war effort, especially in terms of trade, natural resources. That's a good question. Any other questions? OK. Just a couple of uh, remarks on. Stalin and Hitler. It's very funny, is they're very alike in that they're totalitarians. Hitler's about 50 when the war breaks out. Stalin's 61. They've had a similar career. I think you read in The Warlords that Stalin admires Hitler for the liquidation of his enemies. They both uh, tend to admire people like Mussolini. And they both have a very cynical view of one another. They both think that ultimately there's going to be a war between them and one or the other will start it. But for now, they see that there's advantages in having peace. Now, what do we mean by that? Russia has fought an inconclusive, slightly uh, positive in its results, war with Japan in 1939, but it, it does not want troops uh, on its western. It doesn't want all of its troops here facing Germany and then having to fight Japan. So after the Japanese war, the <coughs> non-aggression pact seems like a gift from heaven. That he will, uh, just as Hitler is willing to trade, uh, turn, I should say, on his Axis partner, Japan, Russia will take advantage of it. He can, he can be, it can move some troops over from Japan. Japan is not going to be outdone. Remember, among thieves, there's no honor. So Japan, in turn, will have a non-aggression pact in, in April 1941 with Russia, and that will allow Russia to take its troops back again. And notice the timing. It couldn't have come as a worse time to Hitler. And it's indicative that these axes, Mussolini, Hitler, Tojo, and to a lesser extent, Stalin, don't trust any, of it, any one of the other, and they are not at all integrated, as we'll see as the case with England and the United States. So in Germany's way of thinking, everything has turned out well. The German people didn't sign up for all this. They signed up because they bought the propaganda that they had never lost World War I. They had surrendered 70 miles here into Belgium and parts of France. They were stabbed in the back by communists and Jews, or so Hitler and the fascist and the Nazi party told them. And they were treated very poorly at Versailles. It's a very bad idea to be harsh in word and then soft in deed, and that's what the Versailles Treaty did. It humiliated the Germans without uh, affecting their ability to come back or to make war. They were not occupied as will happen in World War II. So the German people are delighted about Poland, whom they thought grew at their expense after World War I. They have no problem with Denmark because it was easy. They have a little bit of problem with Norway. These are Nor similar Nordic Aryan peoples. Uh, they're scared stiff of a war in France because of what happened in World War I. Four years, 70 miles. So when Hitler starts talking about going into France, 
they think, oh no, another four years, two million dead in World War I on the German side. And then in 40 days when he absorbs France, they're just delighted and they think that because the war is either won or lost in France as it had been in World War I, it's, it's over now. And now there's no problem with Russia because Russia's a partner with Germany, so to speak. And if there was going to be a partner, just as Russia fell in two years and France held out for four, if, if they do have to fight it, France under that paradigm, 40 days, so therefore the next time Russia will fall in 10, 12 days by that two to one or three to one rate time ratio. Uh, they have Italy as a, as a stalwart ally and they're just tickled pink that everything has worked out perfectly. They're a little worried and angry that the British keep persisting, but then they're imperialist. There's been a, uh, a very effective pro propaganda campaign by Goebbels that, these, that we are socialists, that we're workers, and we're not uh, capitalist. It's not quite like communism, but it's very effective in just suggesting that the British are holding out because they've always been greedy and they like to have an empire. Russia is delighted with this turn of events. Stalin, who still resents the Western democracy's participation in trying to choke off the Bolshevik Revolution in 1920, had wanted Germany, after the non-aggression pact of August 1939, they had wanted them to turn their attention to France and Holland and Belgium and Britain. And in his fantasies, these bourgeoisie capitalist societies would just tear each other apart. The only thing they're mad about, as I said, when we were reading the warlords is what? The war only lasted 40 days. And they didn't do enough damage or kill enough people. But as far as Stalin is concerned, this is, this is wonderful. At this point, Stalin hates Britain and America much more than he does Germany. So from 1939, September 3rd, until December 8th, and actually 10th in the case of Europe, Britain is all alone doesn't think it can win the war, its whole strategy is to hold out until two things happen. The United States can be brought in and inevitably these two people, Stalin and Hitler, will turn on themselves. Churchill's convinced of that, but they have to, they have to last. Why doesn't he make peace? Because Churchill has not just a practical idea that it would mean the end of Britain as he knew, knows it, he's an idealist too. And he believes that for all the Jews and for all the people in Europe who believe in constitutional government, for all the people who are being murdered every day, that Britain alone, the BBC, British intelligence, British propaganda, British food, is the only beacon of hope. Now, we're going to talk about the Allies in, in this class on masters and commanders. We're going to see why it is that Britain and the United States work so well together. Hitler doesn't think that we're going to get along too well because he'd seen World War I and how difficult the French and the British and the Americans were. Taken as a given, you would all think that it would be a natural relationship because America was a colony of Britain. We're both English-speaking countries. We fought together in World War I. In fact, how they were able to coordinate their efforts and how they survived as friends is beyond me to this day, given the obstacles that they had to overcome. And at the heart of this relationship is a two or three or four factors that will make it very difficult for them to communicate well. The first is the memory of World War I. We in America in 1941 have a very different idea of the First World War than did the British. Remember, the British are right next to it. If you're in Britain, you can take a boat in the morning and visit the battlefield if you're Douglas Haig, and you can uh, go back and talk with Lloyd George in the afternoon. Britain will lose 970,000 dead and another million and a half casualties, and it will get nowhere from 1914 to May, June of 1918. It won't really move. It's the death camps of the First World War, so to speak. So they have a very, very bitter move, memory of it. France will lose almost two million. Germany itself will lose about two and a half million. In the British mind, when this war starts out, there's one thing you don't want to do, and that is have 
a million or two million people fighting the German army. There's never been anything like it. The German army, whether it's the Franco-Prussian War or World War I, is the most murderous, effective, competent infantry force in the world. And any time the French army or the British army tries to fight it alone, it will lose. So when Churchill, who was first Lord of the Admiralty, World War I, and who himself was a battalion commander in 1916, 1917, in his way of thinking, when we fight this war, we are not going to put a million men right here. And as a corollary of that, remember when he declared war, Chamberlain's government declared war on Germany on September 3rd, 1939, they did put men into Belgium and northern France. The British did. And they didn't do anything until the actual invasion of France on May 10th, and then they were trapped at Dunkirk. A hundred uh, thousand of them were wounded or captured uh, or missing, and the bulk of them survived. But in the British way of thinking, the last thing we want to do is either get everybody killed, as in World War I, fighting these highly effective German stormtroopers, or two, we want another Dunkirk where an ally lures us in and then abandons us. And now remember one thing, because this issue is going to be very important about a second front. Uh, Britain, because it's been at war longer than the United States, when the war breaks out, has a lot more soldiers under arms than we do. So in their way of thinking, that's going to mean us. But these are just larger factors that we're going to get to when we get to the issues. The second is the, the geography and strength. There's going to be a, a very different relationship uh, over 19... 41 to 45. When the war breaks out, Britain is mobilized. It's been at war. It knows a lot about how to fight Germans. It's fought them in 1940. It's been bombing them. And the Americans don't know anything. They think that they can send bombers over in daylight, these wonderful B-17 fort flying fortresses that can shoot down you know, any 109s at will in broad daylight. They think that the American Stuart tank or the Lee tank is wonderful. It, it's us. We're very exuberant, we're excited, we want to go in there and win, and the British uh, have more experience and they have a bigger munitions industry. And then World War I is important too. In World War I, we had no tanks, British supplied them, we had no real effective planes, the British supplied them. So the war starts out with Churchill going to America as a senior advisor, and we're the junior partner. But as this thing starts to gear up, there's a real question in the United States whether we're going to fight this war as we do later, later did Korea or Vietnam or Iraq or we're really going to mobilize. You could have fought World War II with four million men under arms and let Russia and Britain fight it, or do you want to be the primary arsenal of democracy, so to speak? And we decide that we're going to go, for lack of a better word, whole hog. So we're going to gear up and put 14 million men under arms. We're going to be the biggest producer of ships, of planes, of tanks, artillery platforms. And as this really starts to become evident in 1943-44, the United States is going to be the senior partner. So in this relationship between Churchill and Roosevelt, Roosevelt's going to absorb Churchill's criticisms, but by 1943, we're going to hear again and again, whether it's Marshall to Allen Brook or Roosevelt to Churchill, wait, 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 wait. We're the guys, we're the commanders now. We're the ones that are putting most of the men on the field, most of the supplies, and we're going to make the decision, not just you. And later it's going to be, we're going to make the decision and not you at all. Along with World War II, then, that gives very different views of how this war should be fought. The third thing is, uh, and by the way, Britain is m more exposed. We have two oceans, so when we make a decision that seems reckless, there's not going to be immediate consequences to us in New York or San Francisco. If we make a decision about bombing or the use of fighter air aircraft or going across the channel and that proves to be stupid or disastrous, there can be immediate consequences. If we say we don't really think there's going to be a V1 or V2 program, and if there is, we don't really want to waste resources bombing it, they're not going to send a V2 into San Francisco or Indianapolis, they will into London. So in the British way of thinking, the Americans always tell us what to do. They didn't know anything about World War I. 
They're not ready to fight this war, and the consequences are mostly borne by us if there's a mistake. But there's another issue to this relationship, and that is America's coming out of the largest social political transformation in its history. After the Great Depression in 1929 and the failure of the Hoover administration to uh, correct that economic downturn, and remember, Hoover is not some reactionary laissez-faire capitalist as he's somewhat, somehow portrayed. He's tried stimulus. He's tried deficit spending. He's tried balancing. He's tried everything. It didn't work. Roosevelt comes in with an idea that the war, the depression was caused by a concentration of wealth. He's going to change the tax code. He's going to absorb private industry. He's going to create jobs. He's going to borrow money. He's going to have deficit spending. He's going to inflate the currency. He's going to get America back to work. And by 1938, America's unemployment rate is still 19%. This country is very unsure of itself, but it has made a decision because of the, char the charismatic approach of Franklin Roosevelt, the sincerity, the wonderful rhetoric that it's going to stick with Roosevelt. He's going to be elected for the third time in 1940, but he's a man of the left. Churchill is a 19th century relic. This is a man who fought various times in the Sudan for empire, in India for empire, in South Africa for empire. He's been to Cuba. He's written about empire. He's a direct descendant of the Duke of Marlborough. He's wealthy, he's educated, he was a military officer, he's been first Lord of the Admiralty twice. There's no person on either side of the war, no leader, not Hitler, not Stalin, not Mussolini, who is better educated, more versed in military affairs, more experienced, more knowledgeable than Winston Churchill. The problem in the American way of thinking is he's a right-wing reactionary apologist for the British Empire. So just think for a minute. It would be as if George Bush was a lot more far right than he is and Tony Blair was a lot more far, far left than he was and they were supposed to work together in Iraq. As it was, Bush was a conservative and Blair was a liberal. It would be as if we find ourselves in a war with Obama very, very hard left and a European uh, nationalist party person almost with a Eurocentric view of the world. It would be very hard for those two people to work. <coughs> and how is that going to translate out? It's going to mean that every time Churchill suggests something to Roosevelt, people like Harry Hopkins or Harold Ick is always going to be suspicious and say that, you know, he's just trying to promote a hyper-capitalist, imperialist point of view. And every time somebody's going to suggest something to Churchill, he's going to say, these are very na naive Americans who really do believe that you know, socialism is going to solve all our problems. And then they have a very, uh, so World War I and the geography, relative strength, their own politics are going to affect this relationship. Also, this idea of Russia. Now remember that when they start bombing Britain right after the fall of France, you're a British subject. And you look up and there are Heinkel bombers and there's Stuka dive bombers and Junker. The whole bit is going to kill 40,000 people in the Blitz. And the papers are starting to see that in 1940, let's say in August, these guys are laughing about it and they have direct rail links into the Ruhr all the way into eastern and even to western Germany. And the materials of the German Wehrmacht are coming from Russia in some part. This is part of Stalin's sort of plan that they're going to destroy each other. The British are going to have a very distrustful view of Russia because Russia wanted them to be destroyed. Russia was an active participant in some sense with the German effort to bomb them to smithereens. And um, the more imperialist Churchill thinks he is, the more anti-Bolshevik he is. If you read the British communiques of the War Office, they know all about the show trials. They know about the execution of somewhere between 600,000 dissidents, military officers, intellectuals in Russia. They know about the Great Famine in the late 20s under Stalin. They know that 20 million people. So for them, it's a real question whether you want to give a lot of aid to Russia because it's nominally useful but ultimately, 
there's not a lot of difference between Hitler and Stalin. So you can see what this is going to do in this relationship. This is the World War II version of let Iran kill Iraq off and vice versa in the 1980s and the American point of view. America, on the other hand, there are a lot of people. We don't want to get near that topic on a class on war about McCarthyism, communism, whether Alger Hiss was a communist. Let it just be said, there are a number of naive Americans involved in this transformation of American society who look on the Soviet Union as sort of an unhappy or unfortunate excess. Not necessarily evil, not killing more people than Hitler did, but sort of socialism gone too far. But it could come back, it had the right idea, but it's a natural partner. If you look at Howard Zinn's History of World War II, the chapter on World War II is called A People's War, very favorable to the Soviet Union. And that will affect this relationship. Before we go on to how these differences in culture, history, are going to affect the actual mechanics of the war policy, anybody have any questions at this point? None? Okay. So the war breaks out in your Churchill and Roosevelt, and you want to know how to beat Hitler and beat Mussolini and beat Tojo the Japanese uh, co-prosperity sphere. And what we actually did is not the way it necessarily had to happen. We could have tried to invade Amsterdam. We could have <coughs> tried to invade Norway. We could have landed troops in Portugal. We could have uh, gone from the Suez and had an American fleet and gone into Greece or Leros or Rhodes. Or we could have had the Pacific fleet or something go into the Persian Gulf and come in here and try to help Russia. We did actually in the annexation of Iran. But there are a lot of different strategies. Nobody says we have to have 14 million men mobilized. Nobody says we have to have these enormous transformations in American society. We were very effective in World War I, but we didn't quite do what we did in World War II. So these are going to be decisions that are made at the highest levels of the American government and the British government on how they can best fight. The first big issue is Europe first. And as I said, all of these differences that are fundamental and existential are going to play out here. Why should Europe be first for the United States? We were not attacked by Germany. We were attacked by the Japanese on December 7th. The Japanese are close to the Pacific coast. They're all in the waters of Hawaii. They've attacked American-held soil. They've taken over, or they're trying to take over the Philippines. They're going to attack Wake Island. They've taken over the Marianas. Uh, they're uh, encroaching on American spheres of influence. America will never be attacked by Germany in the sense of a German bomber or shell. Japanese will even shell the coast in one case. They'll send uh, balloons with bombs over it. So in America's way of thinking, Japan is the problem. There's a somewhat of a racial element. The Japanese look different than we do. A lot, and there's not a lot of Japanese in the United States except on the West Coast. There's a lot of Germans at places like Michigan here. So, and there's a lot of people in uh, the 1930s, amid the Depression, who thought, you know, Charles Lindbergh, Father Coughlin, Germany was just trying to find an ideology. It's not really Nazism. It's not that bad. They were just trying to mobilize uh, the people, build autobahns, create dams, industrial sectors, give people apartment buildings, national health care. This is what he did, was really about. He gave people back their pride. We feel guilty about Versailles. The, United, uh, the League of Nations was never a good idea. So there's a lot of, uh, remember, this is not the war. People don't really know. It's only been about five months fighting in Russia. So people really don't know the full horrors of Germany. So an American way of thinking, there are a lot of people who think, gee whiz, let's give aid and let's step up the aid for Russia. Privately, we'd like Russia to fight Hitler and, and get rid of both of them. But let's give aid to Russia through Iran, and let's help the British give aid through the Arctic Sea, and let's really help Britain while we turn our attention militarily to the Pacific coast and crush Japan. 
We have a very soft spot in our hearts for China, which has been occupied since 1931. Let's free the Chinese. And then once we solve that problem, we can turn our attention to Hitler. If he's even there, he may be finished off by the Bolsheviks. He may be bombed by the uh, British. But let's not fight a two-front war. There's a great myth about World War II that Hitler lost because he fought a two-front war. No, we fought a two-front war. Remember, when this war from 1939 to 1941, it was a brilliantly diabolical one-front war. This, the Molotov-Ribbentrop agreement is designed to have a one-front war, and it works. And then people say, well, why did he start a second war up front in 1941? Well, he started a second front because there was no war going on. He'd won it. Britain was being bombed. Britain had no ability to land troops, so Hitler had a one-front war, a different one-front war. We, we think we're so smart, we ended up with a two-front war. And people are saying, let's not do this. So there are elements within the American government and military who are trying to say, especially Ernie King, Chief of Naval Operations, let's not fight and get sucked into the British war. We have our own war. Fortunately for the Europe first strategy, Roosevelt sees that Hitler is, has the greater strength, the greater resources, perhaps even the greater evil, and he has to be done, dealt with first, and that will free up um, the United States. Russia may fall if we have a Pacific first uh, strategy. And the, you know, Hitler's like a snake. The more animals he swallows, he needs time to digest it, but then he gets stronger and bigger. So you don't really have a lot of time but this issue is going to be very important because Britain will be pushing for a first front war, first front war, because it's almost ready to be obliterated. It has interest in the Pacific, but even as much as it wants to hold India and Singapore and all of those jewels of the empire, it's willing to, not, uh, to put them second in comparison with the British homeland. That's going to be a issue all of 1942. To what degree do we put uh, resources? And how is it going to be solved? It's going to be solved in a very brilliant way that may have been inadvertent. The Americans are going to learn a couple of things. Given the vast 3,000 mile expanse of the United States, and given the fact that most of the industry in the United States is bilateral, in the sense that the Great Lakes region and the East Coast naturally can, can turn its attention to Europe, while the Pacific great centers of commerce in Seattle and Oakland and San Francisco and Los Angeles, San Diego, can turn to the Pacific. So yes, we have a two-front war, but one way of looking at it is there's two United States. Each one is fighting their own war. It's more likely that a lot of, if you grew up in California, it's not certain, but it'd be very likely that you would fight in the Pacific more likely. doesn't mean it always is true. If you're in a factory, it's very likely you'll be making produce that'll largely be used for the Pacific. So that's one way that we, we solve that dilemma, that the country is so big and vast and the industrial centers are on the coast and the population bases, even in the 40s, tend to be on the coast, that we can divert Western resources. The second is the nature of the theaters. Think about it for a minute. The Japanese empire spread all over the Pacific. So if George Marshall wants to make 8 million people and make an 8 million man army, three, 400 divisions and combat divisions, tanks, artillery, the whole thing, how are you going to use them in the Pacific? You've got to transport them all around. So that effort to create this monstrous army is going to be designed to function on the European continent not on a little island like Iwo Jima or Tarawa or even in the Philippines or Okinawa. Those will be prop mostly amphibious operations and you can create a force for that. There will be army divisions in the Pacific, but it's largely going to be the 1st Marine Division, the 6th Marine Division, the 2nd Marine Division, and the Pacific Fleet. The Pacific Fleet's battleships will finally get up to about 50. It'll get 78 carriers, heavy and medium, but they're mostly going to be in the Pacific. There's going to be a few battleships, but there's no German Navy. 
and there's going to be artillery support in Italy, there's going to be artillery support that you need at D-Day, you're going to need destroyers to uh, guard the convoys that are providing key supplies to Britain, but the Navy is going to have to be in the, the wide open theater in the Pacific. Why? Because the second largest Navy in the world after the United States will not be Britain very quickly, it'll be Japanese. So in the American way of thinking, they handle, they finesse that problem by saying, okay, we're going to say it's European first, but we're going to have the West Coast be assured, all those politicians, Governor Warren out there, they're going to know that most, a lot of their resources are going to go to what's next to them, and more importantly, we're going to spend, put the Navy and the Marines in the Pacific largely, and the Army and the heavy bombing campaigns, at least in the beginning, the Liberator and B-17 campaigns, they're going to be in Europe and North Africa. And that's a brilliant way of solving. The British are delighted because they have interest in the Pacific. And um, they have the existential question of protecting the homeland. The third great issue is uh, after the war, and I want to put a dash here. We talked about this last time, and that's the empire. In the American way of thinking, one of the great evils in the American liberal conscious of 1930s, 40s, is early 40s, is the British Empire. Especially because we did not want to be part of it. We rebelled and we look at the United States and we say, see what can happen when you're free of Britain. We're not very magnanimous and we don't really appreciate British institutions, British culture, British lineage. It makes America so unique. Everybody, you know, from John Locke to Edmund Burke. But nevertheless, there's a resentment of the British Empire. There's a lot of continental immigrants in the United States, especially German-speaking families that don't like the British Empire. And how that works, and as men of the left, the Roosevelt administration is very suspicious, is how does that work out? Well, it reflects all of these issues that we talked about, World War I and the uh, left-right uh, dichotomy, and especially Russia. So there's going to be a, another great debate, and that is, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, because I want to get to the second front in a minute. Uh, what do you do with the British Empire? And how do you fight when we know that everything from the Dutch East Indies to Burma to India <coughs> are all there to protect British oil, British natural resources, rubber, and especially the crown jewel in India? And you, are you really going to tell an American that he died in Burma trying to preserve India for the British? Or he died in Indochina, so he's going to fight for the French Empire? No. So what happens is, in a very brilliant move, and you remember the letter that Andrew Roberts quotes when Roosevelt sort of divides up the sphere of influence. The Americans are going to say, you know what, we're going to go uh, as Americans. We always like to find the enemy and mobilize and destroy them and get home. So we're going to target our efforts on the Japanese mainland. We're not going to go up to Burma. We're not going to, we'll help you with the Burma Road, Burma Airlift, et cetera, et cetera. But we're not going to operate in that part of the Pacific. We're going to try to island hop. And we especially want, because of our historic ties to the Philippines, to restore the Philippines. But we're going to outsource that part of the Pacific to you and your imperial interest and we're going to build aircraft carriers and a long-range bomber, which will eventually be the B-29, and we're going to destroy the Japanese mainland. And the British are delighted at it, because if Americans want to cut off the head of the octopus, the tentacles in Burma that threaten India will fall to us. So that issue is an issue about the British Empire. But as it works out in the Pacific, there's an easy solution, uh, just as there is among us whether we should have an Europe or uh, Japan first policy. In um, Europe, it's a problem. And I'm kind of conflating this Russia here, post-war here, Stalin here. But, and now we get to the second front. All of these issues are involved. And that is, okay, so we've got some kind of agreement that will fight in Europe that the Americans will fight a full-blown, fully mobilized two-front war that nominally at least they'll concentrate on Europe, but there will be large elements of their amphibious forces, Marines, Navy, that will deal with Japan. 
and that we have a way or an accord or a protocol with dealing Japan that will not infringe on the British Empire and yet not think, not a, give the appearance that the Americans are fighting for colonialism. That we're fighting against the people who attacked us on Pearl Harbor. But we still have this other problem. The British do not want a second front, as we said, and that seems to be the theme of the entire Andrew Roberts Masters and Commanders, and be frank, also the warlords, that one issue. They don't want a second front. And we talked about it because of Ver uh, Passchendaele, the Battle of Somme, later 1940, Dunkirk, that's one issue. They're going to have to, at least until 1942 and 1943, they would have to put the bulk of the troops but there's another issue, and this is what I want to get at. They, I mean, Hitler, I mean, Churchill can say all he wants that I, I'll help the devil if it's to be, defeat Hitler. I'll help, I'll help Stalin if I have to. But deep down, the British, rightly so, deeply resent what Stalin did to them in 1939, 1940, 1941. So Stalin is very rude to say the British ambassador, Ambassador Cripps. And then suddenly he's attacked on June 22nd, and he says, now I want to be your friend. And as we said when we discussed Stalin earlier, the modus operandi of the Stalin mind is that whatever I have done to other people, I'm convinced they're going to do to me. So just as I signed a non-aggression pact with Hitler trying to thwart him to destroy England, I know that they'll do the same thing with him to destroy me. So Stalin is going to call for a second front immediately. And the Americans... A, having a very different view, as I said earlier, World War I, one year, 117,000 dead, same thing will happen in World War II. There are really Americans who believe, hey, John Pershing got a million men on the continent from April 1917 to October 1918. One million Americans went over to Britain. We lost zero in transit. They provided the big push. They didn't get involved in Verdun or Passchendaele. They won the war. These people, Marshall, after all, had been on the chief of staff at Pershing. They said to themselves, it can happen again. Within one year, we'll have this enormous army. We'll send them over there. They'll probably be in the same battlefields they were in World War I. The only difference this time is that we're not going to have an armistice. We're going to occupy and humiliate and transform Germany. And the British are saying, all you're going to... I shouldn't say sane, they're saying it in private communications. All you guys are going to do is get us all killed by these horrific German divisions, and all you're going to do is, be help, is to help Stalin, because he's the one that wants it, and Stalin wanted it to destroy us, so just hold on a minute and let's get some experience. And so from 1941 in December all the way until 44 in June, there's kind of this kabuki dance between George Marshall and Allen Brooke and Churchill and Roosevelt. And the Americans bring in the British and say, okay, we're ready to land in France. And the British said, we are too. And they say, give us a date. And they say, yeah. And then they say, how about 42? And the British, eh, if you insist. And the British go home and say, I think we got them stalled another year. They come in 42, and they say, okay, we want to go in 43. And the British, mm, yeah, that's a great idea. And so what's behind the American idea? Got to save Russia. It's going to kill two out of three Germans. If they lose the war, then we'll, we'll suffer the kind of losses they do. It's the moral thing to do. We did it in World War I. Ulysses S. Grant taught us that the strategy of the American military is Clausewitzian, you find the enemy, you target him, and you destroy him. And that means land right here at Calais and go right into the Ruhr and destroy German commerce, and the war is over. And the British are saying, no amphibious capability, 10 to 15 American combat divisions, you'll be slaughtered. We couldn't do it with 300,000 at Dunkirk. You're eventually going to have to do it. If you're going to have a million men, you need a million men. You don't have air superiority. You have not crippled German industry yet. The bombing campaign is very problematic. The German army is, even though it's 1942, the high watermark 
of the Russian campaign is not failing at Moscow, but being very successful down here. And they're all the way, remember, uh, to the Volga and out to Stalingrad, all the way to here. And the British are saying, let's think about this. Second thing, the New Dealers are not that suspicious of state-imposed socialism. And they think, as I think some of you brought up that quote where Stalin, uh, Roosevelt says, my attitude with Stalin is I just give him everything and don't ask for anything in return, and I ameliorate his behavior. And that's not the British idea. They understand that the Home Office is saturated with spies, that the Soviet Union's methodology of conducting war is analogous to Hitler. And so the way that they get around this, remember there's going to be, the theme here is that there's these irreconcilable differences that Hitler thinks will tear apart the alliance. As I said, they're here. And yet it doesn't. They work perfectly well. And that's because they're able, because of the personalities of Roosevelt, the master politician, and Churchill, the brilliant strategist, educated, erudite guy, is they're able to have these solutions, as we just talked about, Europe first, Pacific theater. And the solution they get is, rather than just going for the juggler and getting a death-to-death 50-50 chance of winning or losing, let's soften Germany up. And how are we going to soften Germany up? We're going to do it in six or seven ways. First of all, we've got to destroy the U-boat fleet. Why? Because the British tell us we are sending Lin, uh, very critical supplies to Stalin north of Norway, down here the Arctic Circle, into the White Sea to Archangel. And they're losing 25% of them as they get off the coast of Norway where there's a lot of U-boat pens. So let's get American destroyers, American bo long-range bombers, British destroyers, and let's make sure that we don't lose any more on the convoy system. And the, the highest level will be up in 1942. And the British say, we're not going to be able to stockpile Operation Bolero, remember, to make Britain an American supply depot. We're not going to be able to have enough resources. So let's do that first. So America engages in a massive sea building. And this is a great strife with King does not want to commit Pacific naval resources here. But he loses that battle, finally. Belatedly, but finally. The second thing that the British convince us, hey, you guys, you built the world's best bomber, the B-17. You've had it since 1937. You, not us, you call it the Flying Fortress. Let's use air power. On day one of this war, we were flying in with Halifaxes, and uh, we've got a, a big Lancaster bomber in the works, and we will, we will bomb Germany. And that will be a second front. By the way, they're going to lose 40,000 Brits and 25,000 Americans, so it's going to be a bloody battle. And once again, this is very important. I think you should make a note of it in this relationship because you can see what a second land front would have been like in 42 and 43 had the British allowed us to do what George Marshall and, and Roosevelt wanted to do. And you can see that through the air campaign because we go over there confident, swaggering, and say we have a B-17, <laughs> we have a B-24 that we're it's going to come out. They're precision. We have something called the Norden bomb site that you don't have. You have a cruise of three. We have crews of nine, ten. We fly in formation. They're absolutely a fortress, and, and the British say, don't, don't tell us that. We've been losing 10 to 15 percent of our crews as a bomb because what the Germans do is you leave England, they pick you up on radar, and they have 20 to 30 bases here and here, and they just pass you off from 109 squadron to 109, and it's good as plain as a Spitfire, and the new Focke-Wulf 190 is better, and they're excellent pilots, and they'll shoot you down like you will not believe. And we're doing this at night, and we're doing it in singular formation. We don't come announce where we're going. If you think you're going to stack up 100, 200 bombers, and it's going to be in broad daylight, and then you're going to be up at 20,000 feet and drop individual bombs. It's a, it's a prescription for suicide, and it is. And we don't know any, anything what we're doing in 42 and 43. It's a testament to the uh, people like the 8th Air Force. They don't give up. But in typical American 
ingenuity and know-how and learning from error, uh, a group of brilliant people, Jimmy Doolittle, Hap Arnold, Curtis LeMay, they look at the situation and they say, this is winnable if we start acting smart. We develop a fighter that can escort us over to Germany. First the P-47, then the P-51. If we develop drop tanks so that they have a, la a long operational capability over enemy territory, especially as we take back France, we have home soil, so we're not bailing out all the time on enemy soil, and there's not enemy uh, fighter bases all along our route, especially as we give up the idea that we're going to bomb so high, and maybe we'll have to, heaven forbid, use incendiaries like the British. But finally, it starts to pay real dividends in mid to late 1944. But you can see that American attitude, what it would have done with a second front. It would have been a disaster. The other thing that Churchill insists on is, so we have the submarine campaign, and we have the bombing campaign, and let's peel off German sphere of influence. The only problem with this is that since Germany is engaged with three million men in Russia, it's actually pretty good for Germany to get out of these places. When the war ends, they're going to have 30,000, two, over two divisions up in Norway doing nothing. But as you can see, there's German planners who are telling Hitler, we're being attacked like this. We don't want to be spread. Let's have interior lines of communication like we did in World War I, and let's not be spread over. But the irony is that the British do convince us, okay, you guys want to have a European first, we, we convince you of that. You want to go into Germany, you can't do this yet. You can't meet these SS divisions head on. So let's go into Morocco, November 1942. Montgomery will turn the tide at El Alamein. Though you can learn your craft against second-tier German divisions that haven't been on the Russian front. We can do this, and we can expel the Germans out of North Africa. Once we do that, Malta is safe. Oil supplies are safe. They kept, and we do that very well. And we're, by late spring 1943, that's over. Then we go, and they say, then we can go into Sicily. We do that. I don't know quite, look at the map. I don't know quite what Sicily does for you. You take an island, okay, but we might as well take Crete. We never do that until the war's over. I don't know what Sicily gives you, really. Uh, I guess it helps knock Italy out of the war. But if you knock Italy out of the war, that's wonderful, and we'll do that by 1944. But you still are going through a mountainous 500-mile-long peninsula, and that seems to me, if you want to go here, this is a very bad way to do it. But... As you know, the British are telling us, at least you're not invading France in the wide open area against the German Wehrmacht. And more importantly is this issue that we talked about, Russia. At Stalingrad, between November 42 and 1943, by February, end of January, 600,000 Germans surrender, missing, lost, killed in that larger campaign. And there's not really going to be a chance again that Hitler's going to win the war quickly. It's going to be a war of attrition. And by that period in 1942, all of this Lynn lease, all of this direct aid from the North, uh, Arctic Circle through Iran and Soviet industry, command economy, uh, Russia's really now, and Japan's got its hands full, so divisions are, have all come from. Um, the opposite coast, Russia is in a very good position. And it's starting to not only be in a good position, but to worry far-seeing pe seeing people like the British. And when they start to see the Red Army, Churchill and others think, you know what? We saw what they did when they were on Hitler's side and when they divided up Poland. And when this thing comes across like this, and they get into Germany, there's not, and they turn Germany on their side, there's nothing going to be anything. So if you land, the Americans land here, boy, 
there's nothing stopping the Red Army. This is an anathema to us, the idealists. So Churchill says, well, go up through the soft underbelly. There's, that's not very soft. I don't know if it's an underbelly. But then let's even go over here to Rhodes and Laros and go, I don't know what that would do, get Turkey and go along the Black Sea and then meet the Russians. I think Churchill's idea is that the Americans in 1944 are here in Poland and they say, okay, stop. You did a great job, you got the Germans out, let us take care of them, and then we tell the Germans, we're on both sides of you now, we'll let these Russians come in, so just quit. And then all of this area here is not going to fall to communism. Of course, the Americans just see this as absolutely diabolical. And another way of the British imperialists trying to finagle a post-war um, advantage for themselves. And so the second front is going to be a fierce issue. And how is this dilemma going to be solved between Churchill and Roosevelt? It's going to be solved, as I said, as the, under the guise that the American army is feeling itself out. It's learning. It's getting re-equipped. It doesn't have really good tanks. The Sherman tank is not as good as the best German tanks, but it's good enough to function, I suppose, in Europe. It's going to have uh, a million man force as it did in World War I, and by 1944 it's going to have some people like the 1st Armored Division that have fought in Morocco, they fought in Sicily, they fought in Italy, they're, they're going to be pretty good veteran people, they're going to have air superiority, they're going to have taken a toll on the bombing campaign, and there's a chance. And what's wondrous about this, it works. Once again, just like it was the right decision to have Europe first and they solved the problem, of dividing up the Pacific theater, and they solve the problem of American public opinion, more worried about Japan. So too with the second front. Um, they did take the pressure off Stalin. Stalin would have lost that war had there not been American and British pressure through bombing, for example. Let me just give you a couple of examples. He, the Wehrmacht will transfer 10,000 88 millimeter platforms to protect their cities from bombers. Each one of those was one of the most superb anti-tank weapons the German army had. German labor, German transportation will be severely hard pressed by bombing. That takes a load off, a load off the Soviet Union. The Germans have about 40 divisions in North Africa and at various times in Italy and Sicily that are not committed to the Western Front, so to the Eastern Front. So it's a very, it, it does work. And by the time we get there, think of the results. The tide supposedly turns when the German army is stopped, Army Group Center stopped 26 miles outside of Moscow in late December. Americans invade June 6, 1944. The distance from Normandy here to Berlin if you look on the map like this, it's about 900 miles, and from here to Soviet Union, it's about 1,100 miles. So the Americans are going to go with the British and the Canadians. are going to go from here all the way into the center of Germany in nine months, and the Russian army is going to take four years. I know you're going to say there's better troops, more German resources, but it's much harder to land an army and supply it on a coast when you're 3,000 miles away as the United States, then to fight right here with your industrial base and fighting with the elan that comes from defending your homes. And so that achievement is absolutely brilliant, what the American and British, the Schaefe uh, overlord planning did. In nine months, they ended that war. Just absolutely brilliant. It's never been re uh, repeated. And out of that, some of their best commanders on either side of the war, we always think of Zhukov or Konev as these brilliant guys, but there's never been an uh, army group commander quite like George Patton. And there hasn't been some divisions, uh, First Armored Division, for example. They were absolutely superb. And that, that solves the problem, then, of the, of the uh, so-called Second Front. And the result of all this is, and now we'll take some questions, is that an alliance that Hitler knew that would break up and he knew that because of the differences between Britain and America. And he admired Britain, by the way, much more than he did us. And he knew that in his own experiences with the Japanese, he had tricked the Japanese into one non-aggression pact with the Germans, and they tricked him with another. And that Mussolini had attacked Greece without telling anybody. In other words, suspicion, distrust, 
lack of cooperation characterized his tripart alliance, and he projected that to ours, and he was absolutely wrong. We not only got along with the British, the British got along with us, we kept the mass murdering Stalin as a third part of the, of the alliance, and, that, and the result of it was absolutely amazing to end that war in four years. Before we go on in the second half of the class, uh, does anybody have any questions at this point? I know that we covered a lot of material, and I want to stop for a second. Go ahead. Um, was was um, solving the U-boat problem or ending the U-boat dominance critical to the success of Operation Bolero? It was. Operation Bolero is that amorphous term, uh, not for a second front per se, but just for making the British Isles, Scotland, all the way down to Wales as a depot for American material. Then you could find out what you wanted to do with it, but you got to get it over there. And you were losing... By June to August 1942, you were losing in some convoys 25 to 30 percent of the material was being blown apart by U-boats. And uh, there didn't seem to be a way around it because there was large expanses off the map in, in the Atlantic that uh, air power either from the east coast of America or from Ireland and the western parts of Britain could not reach. Remember, a U-boat is very, very vulnerable 90% of the time. That's when it's above the water. It has batteries, electric batteries, underneath the water. It can't stay down there more than a few hours. So they have to surface. They're almost completely defenseless. They have a small little gun, and that's when you want to attack them. But the problem is they have a very low silhouette. You can't see them, and they're lethal. Whether they're under the ground or under the water or on the surface, they can shoot torpedoes. And when you don't have air cover in large areas, so how, what's the solution to it? You crack the German naval codes, which they do. It tells us where these wolf packs are going to congregate. You get long-range B-17s with extra Catalina flying boats for reconnaissance. The British have mosquito bombers. You get specially designed aircraft that have no blank spots. And uh, you start to really master the convoy system. Convoy system is you put a lot of destroyers around the convoy, and then the, Brit and then the um, German U-boat commander has to make a decision. Is he going to discharge his torpedoes at a, war at a very minor warship and let all of the, the very key uh, transport vehicles go, uh, transport ships get into Britain, or is he going to forget about the destroyers and wait till he can get a shot in between? And he knows that whatever he does, he's going to be subject to an increasing response from death charges, and they're going to be much more sophisticated than they were in 1941. The result of all this, by 1944, um, the U-boat threat is pretty much ended, and with the conquest of Western France and uh, Americans in Belgium and Amsterdam, that base of U-boat shelters, some of you saw Das Boot, the movie, it's ended with, and so then the threat uh, diminishes. It's very important to remember what Hitler tells his commanders, just hang on because we have a super U-boat that has uh, a snorkel that sucks air from the surface and sucks it down into the compressor chambers of a diesel engine and it can operate then 24 hours, 24-7, it's almost like a nuclear sub all the time and if it's under the water all the time nobody can see it that's going to come on and then we can reverse this. It's the same argument he uses with the V-1 and V-2 rocket and the jet aircraft. Just hang on and technology will change the uh, pulse of the battlefield gap. But yeah, it, it, that's, you look at the communications with Marshall and Brooke and uh, supply, 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 supply. We Americans didn't make the best, as I said last time, we didn't make the best tank. We didn't make the best artillery. We did, made pretty good fighters and bombers, but we surely made the best transportation uh, in heavy trucks, jeeps. We made the best uh, food, best Quonson huts, best everything as far as supplying the men in the field with just a sheer um, food, water, fuel. We, nobody was like us, and that would have been impossible had we not solved the U-boat problem. 
and think of where we started. We started in 19, late 1941 with New Jersey Coast people out there dancing them at midnight with all the, uh, the hotels and the resorts lit up and with 50 U-boats off the shore waiting for us to load up a transport plant, uh, ship with its two stacks. It gets 10 miles off the New Jersey or even down to the Florida coast. The U-boat commander sends his periscope. He sees the big hotels and neon lights and right in front of it is a big fat ship and then they sink it right off the coast. That's one of the reasons that Hitler de declared war in the United States. He was convinced that his U-boat commanders had kept saying to him, we can't attack these American convoys, they're supplying England. If you declare war in the United States and let us go, we will destroy England by starving it. And they almost did. But it was a great motivation that explains the inexplicable of why Hitler de declared war on him. Somebody else had a question. Yes. Here. Um, do you think that uh, Germany would have been able to take out the Soviet Union had they taken Moscow? Because Napoleon invaded in 1812 and they just left the city of Yes, the question is that in December of 1941, Army Group Center's right here, and it's very, it's, of all the three Army Groups, remember that Army Group North has not taken uh, Leningrad, it's surrounded it. Army Group South has been in some ways the most successful, but they have diverted in August, they made that big encircling movement and taken Kiev, and now they they pretty much, they will take the Ukraine, uh, the Ukraine and the Crimea, but had they taken Moscow, would that have made a difference? And you make a good point that Napoleon took it and nothing happened. I'm not sure it would have. I think that the Soviets could have um, evacuated it, which they were ready to do. They could have evacuated the city in a week. They were prepared. They'd already transported their heavy industry. The German high command believed that the symbolic value was such that it would cause a loss of will among uh, Russian resistance. I don't think it would have. I think it would have helped them, but I don't see if you, what won the war, let's put it this way. What won the war is if you take a chart and you look at tank production, plane production, artillery production, small arms production, transport production, and you put America, Britain, Russia, Germany, Italy, Japan, well it's, it's going to go from about 4 to 1 to 10 to 1 by 1943. We were producing, we the Allies, were producing so many goods and services, it's very hard to see how the Germans were going to um, catch up. There's another thing that is very important, and that is that Hitler is a brilliant political strategist. He understands to the T the rot and the weakness in the 1930s democracies. He knows that they won't do anything, they'll talk... Uh, day long about peace and human rights and freedom and democracy, but when it comes to actually stopping them, whether it's the Rhineland or the Sudanland or Austria or Czechoslovakia, they won't do a thing. And that they're not able to, uh, to fight the German army, at least for a while. But where he's absolutely wrong is that he translates that domestic and foreign, brilliant insight into foreign relations. It's innate because he's not educated. It's, he's an autodidact. But he translates that into strategic sense, and he doesn't have any. So when these, uh, we know that by the stupid idea of invading the Soviet Union. As I said three classes ago, if you look at German supplies from the Soviet Union, in not one month of occupation of four years did levels of Russian imports ever exceed what Stalin sold, often with credits to the Wehrmacht. In other words, the Third Reich got much more from Russia for its war effort by being part of a pact with it than it did by occupying it, given the disruption that happened. And uh, so what really makes that question important is that given who Hitler was, when he diverts army group center to the south when he says not a, you know no more surrender don't retreat at Stalingrad when he uh, pursues curse uh, when he relieves some very good generals like Guderian all they're not going to win with him and when Stalin after Stalin shoots shoot shoots his commanders at lose he finally gets to a guy like Koniev and Zukov and he basically says I'll settle with them after the war. 
but they're going to be famous during the war, and they're brilliant strategists, and I'm going to let them run the war. And Roosevelt does the same thing, but Hitler doesn't. So I don't think that the, the capture of Moscow would have made a difference because it would, it would presume that it would be of such symbolic value that they would have quit, and I don't see them quitting. And uh, the United States was going to be in the war within... Well, it was in the war, but it was going to be really in the war within a matter of months anyway, given Japan. What would have changed the war? Ah, very, you can see very easily how the Germans and the Italians and the Japanese could have won the war very quickly before the mass productive capacity of Russia and the United States and Britain kicked in. And how would that have happened? I think you all know it. That would have meant that on... June 22nd, 1941, Hitler did not go into Russia, but he only had 75,000 German troops and about 200,000 Italian. There was only 150 British. He had taken of that three million, he'd taken a million and a half and put them right here. And he could have, because he had all of this occupied. He had the Greek ports. He had air cover at Crete. They had Sicily and Italy. He had taken that enormous force. They had not done what Rommel... Rommel only had... When the time of El Alamein was over, he had 26 tanks. There was 3,000 tanks up here. Had they gone in and swept into Egypt and they had taken the Suez Canal, that would have done more to cripple Britain than the convoy battle. Then they could have swept in up here to Transjordan, peeled off British possessions, Vichy France and Syria, and then they're into Iraq and the Persian Gulf, and they have the oil, and they meet up with the Japanese coming uh, up from India. And at that point, uh, with the Soviet Union neutral, I don't know how England would have continued, especially that enormous force then could have been put back here, and they could have probably invaded. So that was the first big mistake that Hitler, and it was a fatal mistake. The second is and we've talked about this in declaring war in the United States. Because given our propensity to want to fight Japan, I, I think there's a good chance it was a 50-50 question whether we would have declared war on Germany. And that would have meant we would have given supplies, but we wouldn't have been doing things in North Africa or Sicily or Italy as we did. Take those two decisions away, and they, they dwarf the occupation of Moscow. And I think there's been a really good chance. And you can see where that would have ended because by 1945, uh, Germany had a sophisticated jet, the ME-262. They had a guided, not a V-1 um, sort of scud, it's not even a scud missile. I guess it was a primitive cruise missile without a guidance system. But it had finally the V-2, which was an intercontinental ballistic missile. And they had, effort, they had designs that might have made something like a V-3. And we, we were at the stages of developing a bomb. So you can see if the war had have lasted into 1946, 47, 48, and Hitler said it would go to 46, it would have been cataclysmic. Other questions? Yes, we have a lot of them. Right here. Okay. Um, it seems like Hitler's generals did have a lot of strategic sense. Did they advocate at all for any sort of cooperation with, say, Japan, or was that just completely? The German high command? Yeah. Uh, the question was, did the German high command uh, agitate for greater integration? I think that in that particular case, the answer was they didn't have time to think about it. Ribbentrop was worried about it. and they, He tried to get the Japanese to stop the Pacific campaign and go back and fight <laughs> Russia, as they had in 1939. Because as you know, what saved Moscow, going back to your question, was the transference on the Trans-Siberian Siberian of at least 40 crack divisions from the Japanese front. So Ribbentrop is saying, get those divisions back over there. And you can do that by invading Russia through Manchuria. And the Japanese are saying, no, we fought them. We lost eight or 9,000 people. There's a diminishing returns. We have a non-aggression pact. We don't want a two-front war. We remember bitterly when we were at war with Russia, right in the middle of it, or shortly after, you signed a non-aggression pact and freed up Russian defense. So we're gonna, we don't have any special loyalty to you. And it's, uh, 
there were efforts to send a Focke-Wulf 190, a German U-boat, see if they could somehow go around the Cape of Good Hope and get to Japan and coordinate it. But pretty much when Hitler woke up on December 8th, he had no idea that Japan was going to uh, attack Pearl Harbor. He was delighted because he didn't have a navy. And he was delighted because he had been brought up that oblivion came from two front wars. He was not in a two front war. And now both Britain and America were in two front wars. And he was just convinced, oh my god, they have a two front war. And the Japanese have the great navy. I don't have to worry about a navy now. They'll tie the British navy down. They'll tie the American navy down. And everything's great. Let's declare war on them and finish them up. We're still December 7th. They're about 30 miles outside of Moscow. So. It, it was all optimism. But you're absolutely right. Had the Tojo and Mussolini and Hitler had the relationship of Roosevelt and Churchill, even Stalin, that would have been quite frightening because the Axis had complementary strengths. The Japanese Navy, the Japanese sources of resources, um, the German military uh, on land. Uh, even Italy had a very sophisticated Navy and um, Air Force, had it been given a, a, a sphere of operations, had the Germans said to Italy, please don't go into Greece, don't go into the Balkans, just forget about that, don't go into the G any of that. Your sphere of influence is you concentrate on Libya and tying the British down and maybe take Malta, and, and this is what you do, and then the Jap Japanese, you attack Russia from one side, we attack it if we're going to do that. Or better yet, let's not attack Russia at all. You take India and come up from Suez. We'll do. None of that existed. Um, part of it's because when you have an ideology that says that the Japanese are Asian supermen and Thais and Koreans and Vietnamese and China are subhuman, and when you have an ideology that says Aryans in Germany are better than Nordics and Scandinavian a lot better than Southern Europeans and a lot, lot better than Slavs and Jews, etc. Then each of these people have this exalted view of themselves that, that makes it very hard to have um, relations with other people. They, they're not prone to it. And then autocracy and dictatorship by nature seems to be a very suspicious system. We had a question back there. Yeah. Um, was Japan focused too much on their Eastern Empire to invade uh, U.S. while they were in Europe, or were they simply just I'm not I'm sorry, strong? I didn't hear that. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, was Japan focused too much on their empire on the mainland in order to invade the U.S. while we were in Germany, or were they just not strong enough to invade the U.S.? Well, Japan had got themselves, I'm sorry I don't have the Pacific, not, and as early as 1931, they'd gone into Manchuria, and by 1937, remember, they had taken, they were on their way to take Shanghai. They were going to kill several hundred thousand civilians in Nanking. And they got bogged down. They took most of the industrialized populated sector of China, but they got themselves in an insurgency of the first order with both Chiang Kai shek and Mao. And so they were tied down. They were tied down in Korea. And uh, the Pacific bloc or the Pacific lobby within the Japanese military went to the emperor and said, look, they told us they were going to annex China and we were going to have this great land empire. And what did they do? They've been fighting here for 10 years. And what do we see? We just see Japanese bodies. There's nowhere you can go. And now they, they, they fought Russia and it didn't work. So this is what we want you to do. They told us that we had to make peace with the United States. And we had a diplomatic effort, and we lied, and we, we uh, subverted, and we did everything, but we didn't go to war with the United States. And we gave them a decade, and they had nothing to show for it. Now it's our turn. So what we want you to do is force the army just to stand down and occupy and make peace with Russia. And then that will allow us to have our chance, Yamamoto especially the architect of this, and we will run a Pacific war. And we will take on America in a one-front war because China will be static. And we will do two things very quickly. And it, it happened. We will get all the rubber and oil from the bankrupt Dutch and British empires we want. We will so threaten India that it will have a mass insurrection. It will break off. And there were nationalist movements. They read all about Gandhi and Bose and all these people. And then we will hit the United States so hard that these gangsters in Chicago that are in the middle of a depression won't know what hit them. 
they were imbued with the Hitler stereotype of us, that they'll sue for peace within six months. And then we have this enormous Pacific naval empire. And then after that, maybe from our victory and our brilliance, we can help the army. And that prevailed. And looking back with the benefit of hindsight, if you were a neutral strategist, you would have probably said that there was more um, opportunity for Japanese expansionism by concentrating on Korea, on Indochina, on Burma, and on Manchuria. That was much better, because uh, they were, as far as Japan, and making a uh, non-aggression pact with the United States. But uh, that was what the problem was. The Japanese army interest and navy interest clashed. And the navy made the argument the army had first choice, and they blew it, and now it was their turn. And that's how it happened, the way it did. And then the irony of the whole thing is, as soon as we got into the war, the Army front heated up. And we started to supply China, and China was re-energized. Manchuria was much more difficult. We were supplying the nationalists through the so-called Burma Road or over the Burma Hump. The British got involved uh, in defending India, and we started to... Um, be so successful that the land front heated up again. A couple of things to remember before we had, somebody else had a question? I saw somebody. Before we stop for a break, remember how this is all going to work out in the post-war era. And we're going to get to that next class, the war from 43, 44, and 45. Today's class was 39, 40, 41 with these masters and commanders. But Remember what the position of the United States is going to be in. It's very ironic and unenviable. So what Churchill and Roosevelt are starting to envision is, so they're going to win. As George Patton says, we went to war for totalitarianism to be destroyed in Eastern Europe, and we ended up ensuring that it would be in Eastern Europe. Just change the name from Nazism to... Soviet communism. That's a simplistic analysis, but there's something to it. And when this war is going to end, and I want to preview the problem that Churchill and Roosevelt, Dash Truman are going to have, Dash um, Anthony Eden and his successors, because as you know, Clement Attlee and all that, Churchill will be gone for a while. But so the war is going to end, and we've empowered the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union took a vacation on the Pacific War until the very end, the last two weeks. And they're going to go supply Mao, and we're going to be ambiguous about that. And Chiang Kai-shek is going to lose, and China is going to turn communist. This is going to be very quick, 1946, 47. And then what do we do? We inherit the Axis. They're devastated, and they're facing communist occupation, overthrow, subversion in places as diverse as Japan, the Philippines, Korea, Formosa, Italy, Germany, all of Western Europe. So here's what the United States is asked to do then. This is something that a historian like Howard Zinn has no appreciation for, much less sympathy. So we win and we, we lose a half a million people and we've got this full mobilization. Then with Britain, the empire is exhausted. There's no support in Britain for the empire. There's going to be nationalist uh, social health care, all of this uh, social program that's going to throw Churchill out. And at its basis is let's not spend money on the empire, let's spend money at home in Britain. So we're going to inherit the British Empire's responsibilities, but we have the worst PR in the world because we now have to save Italy and we have to save Germany, at least the French, American, and British zones of occupation, and rebuild them. And we're going to have to save Japan. And we're going to have to go into Korea. And you know what? We go into a place like Korea. Who's been occupying it? The Japanese. Who's keeping order? And we're going to have to tell the Korean people, hey, you know, we just defeated the Japanese, but we're going to have to make sure that the communists don't come in. The communists are saying, see, they're rebuilding Japan, the fascist, and they're opposing us who fought the fascist. And we're going to have to say to Eastern Europe and everybody, you want a strong Germany. You don't want it completely destroyed. So by 1947, if you want to know why all of Eastern Europe is going communist and Korea, the Korean War is going to break out, 
and China's going to go, and it looks hopeless for the United States, think of the burden of that public relations message. The two worst countries in the world have been Japan and Germany. We defeated them, and almost immediately we're going to occupy them, create democracies, rebuild their economies, and tell the world. That was then. Hitler and Tojo, et cetera, they're gone. But it wasn't the fault of the Japanese people. It wasn't the fault of the German people. They're good people, and now they're our allies, and we're going to arm them so that they can be bulwarks against whom? Our former allies the Communist Chinese and the Communist Russians. So now Americans, just remember, those good guys, Uncle Joe that Roosevelt had his arm around, Mao that we can, they're bad now. And then we have to tell millions of Koreans and millions of Eastern Europeans and all these other people, we have to say to them, I know that there was a little bit of excess that Japanese like to cut your heads off or they shot your mother in Nanking or there's German uh, Wehrmacht officers who shot people, but they didn't really mean that. They're not that bad people. And they're saying to us, it was the Japanese people. It was the German people. And they're saying that from Indonesia to Korea, and they're saying that from um, Bulgaria all the way to Finland. And the Russians are saying, yes, yeah, see? See, the Americans and the British imperialists, they just fought this war not for freedom, not for democracy, not as self-defense, but to hurt people, people's war, the average hoi polloi. So that's a terrible thing to have to do in the, in the early Cold War is to rebuild the enemy and to convince the world that they're no longer the enemy and then fight the friend and tell the world that they were never really our friends, but they were useful. And it's, it doesn't get worked out until 1980 to be quite candid. Any final questions before break? We have one, yeah. Um, do you think that the Allies made a mistake by um, supplying um, Russia so much so that they survived so we, or the so The question powerful is, if we make a mistake by supplying Stalin, that's going to be fought all through the 50s. Somebody's going to stand up in the Senate and say, as we speak in Korea, American boys are killed near the Yellow River. And you know how the Chinese killed them? They were on GMC trucks. And even, they even had radios that they were communicating in their T-34 tanks to MiG-15s in the sky, and they're on those radios that says Made in USA. So yeah, but I, I, once this semester I quoted Tolkien. I know there's some Tolkien people at Hillsdale. And I'll quote him again. I think there's a line somewhere in uh, the last of the trilogy where he says, they say, wow, can't we employ Saruman to use against Sauron or something or can't we? and they're thinking of all those things and finally Gandalf says that we're just we just do the best we can in our time and our station we we try to win in 1941 it was very clear that Hitler was going to win and if Hitler was going to win it would mean the extension of not six but 12 to 15 million Jews and 40 to 50 to million Slavs he was going to kill them all and he was going to create a monstrous, hideous uh, civilization. And we were going to do anything we could to stop it. And at that point, we said to ourselves, these are Russians, they're not communists. Stalin said, I, rally, I call on everybody to support the fatherland 10 days after the invasion. He didn't say communism. So we're going to delude ourselves into saying they're not communist, and we're going to do that. And there were, I mean, the Americans were not all naive. There were people in the State Department and the military that said, okay, we're going to do that. And then as soon as we do that, we're going to have to, I mean, you're not all like George Patton that said, give me those Wehrmacht officers and I can re-equip them and we can get to Moscow, kill those sons of bitches. <laughs> and I want to keep going. Uh, and it'll be a lot cheaper here. Remember he said, I'll be a lot cheaper here when I got the army than take them home and bring them back. But the point I'm making is that... Uh, you do what you can at the time, and you always take the bad choice rather than the worst choice. The bad choice is arming Stalin with the idea that Russian people are people, and Jews are at stake, and the world is facing an existential evil, and then worry about what happens after that with the next generation. And that's what we did. And I think, as I look back at it, it was the right decision. 
Uh, I, I wish that we were not so naive in glorifying Stalin. Um, Harry Truman, thank God, was a great American and understood that almost immediately in a way that Roosevelt had not. Uh, in fact, Truman understood Stalin and the Russians probably as better than even uh, Eisenhower. So we learned, but uh, in, the, in that last analysis, even though we conducted a anti-submarine campaign, a strategic bombing campaign, a campaign in North Africa, Sicily, Italy, Western Europe, all over the Pacific, and we supplied the Russians with billions of dollars. As I said, two out of every three land soldiers um, in the German army, which was really the, the, the tool of terror for the German Reich, were killed by the Soviet Union. And they were killed in part because we helped them. A lot of it was the courage of the Red Army, but uh, they were the ones that broke the back of the Wehrmacht. We broke the back of the German Air Force. We destroyed the German Navy. We freed a lot of peoples. We took the pressure off. But the actual physical thing of getting in um, a trench and shooting a German shoulder was a Russian. And I'll just finish, and we'll have our break. I've spoken too long. But remember one other thing. This is all philosophical theory, theorizing. If you're in 1944, 1943, and you say you want to defeat the German army, that means that you or me, you, not me, I'm 57, you young kids, are going to be given a rifle, and you're going to be given a uniform, and you're going to be put on the opposite side from the German soldier. And he has been fighting for four years, and he's imbued with a military tradition in general from his great-grandparents with the formation of the German state and a Nazi ideal, ideology in particular, and he's going to be equipped with the best machine guns, the best infantry rifles, the best pistols, the best tanks by far, maybe except for the T-34, superior aircraft, the best generals, the best mid-level officers. So when you're sitting in that foxhole, whether you're at the Battle of the Bulge or the Battle of Kursk, and a German division like Das Reich or Hermann Goering or the Adolf Hitler division or Gross Deutsch, whatever they are, they come at you. There's going to be a hundred Tiger 75-ton tanks, and there's going to be veterans. You can call them Nazis, you can call them any name you want, but these are sophisticated killers like the world's never seen. And how do you stop them? It means that X number of you are going to have to run up out of your foxhole with inferior bazookas or anti-tank and try to stop that tiger because in theory there's nothing that can stop it. If you take a tiger tank and you take it through the Hillsdale campus, you can do all you want. You can't stop it. It can go right through down the stair. It can do anything. You cannot stop it. It requires somebody to walk right up to it and at point blank range shoot an anti-tank weapon into it and that person's going to die. Or it takes somebody in a T-34 or a Sherman to get right next to it and shoot, that person's going to die. Same thing with a German soldier. He's going to be a better shot until 1943 at least. He's going to be better trained. He's going to have better, and that's going to be hard. How does one kid growing up in America or, or a Soviet peasant deal with them? And so it's very tragic because when, when he invades Russia and, and Hitler's at its zenith, you look at this as an outsider if you're from Mars and you knew anything about military strategy, you would say to yourself, okay, to take the Third Reich with nine and a half million people in arms and the most sophisticated productive capacity in the world, and things like Focke Wolf 190s and 88 millimeter artillery platforms and Tiger tanks, and to take that so it can't hurt anybody else, that's going to take 10 million dead. There's no way around it, unless you can come up with something like the atomic bomb. There's no way. It's like invading Japan. Everybody says we should, shouldn't have dropped the bomb. How do you go into Japan when there's 7 million people who fought of the same caliber that fought at Okinawa and killed 50,000, wounded 50,000, 50,000 50, total casualties American? You, you can't, it's just do the arithmetic. And so whatever we think about the Soviet Union, 20 million of them were willing to go right up against a German armored division. It's pretty amazing. And a lot of Americans were in British, too. Let's take a, a break, and we'll come back at, um, at the half hour for the last hour. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. 
you can email us at podcasts at c-span.org. Thank you.